Life before Michael was pretty straight-laced, wake up, trade a bit on the stock exchange, head to my job in online advertising, then rinse and repeat. Simple, mundane, but it was mine. I always figured that someday I'd add a family to the mix, husband, kids, the whole shebang. I met Michael at a seminar for amateur traders. He was a speaker, all confidence and broad smiles, talking about big moves in the real estate market. After his talk, we ended up at the same coffee station. Strong coffee, strong investments, right? He joked, pouring himself a cup. Something like that. But I usually go for less volatile stocks myself, I replied, trying to sound more savvy than I felt. Oh, playing it safe, huh? I like taking a bit more risk, he said with a wink. That wink should have been my first warning, but who was I to know? We started seeing each other, and things moved fast, swept up in romance and the excitement of it all. He was 10 years older, had his life figured out, or so it seemed. Loads of charm, money, and promises that came easy to him. About a year into our whirlwind romance, Michael popped the question on a chilly evening, right there on the balcony of his fancy high-rise apartment. Marry me, Sarah. I want all my tomorrows to start with you, he said, holding out a ring that was frankly too flashy for my taste. But who was I to complain? It felt like a dream. Two days before the wedding, Michael dropped another surprise, just as we were finalizing our dinner menu. We need to talk about something, Sarah. It's important, he said, serious all of a sudden. Sure, what's up? I asked, figuring it was just some last-minute guest list drama. I think we should sign a prenuptial agreement, he said, avoiding my eyes. A prenup? Now? Two days before the wedding? I was shocked, feeling a mix of hurt and confusion. Why didn't you bring this up before? It's just, practical, Sarah. It's not about us, it's about protecting what we've got. You know, just in case. I've got a lot tied up in real estate, and you're doing well with your trading. It's just, standard stuff. My lawyer drafted something up. He says it's pretty standard, protects both of us. His casual dismissal, stung. Standard for who, Michael? Your lawyer? I don't even have one. Look, he's a good guy. He'll take care of everything, even talk you through it. On me, of course. I'll pay for it. He added quickly, as if that would smooth everything over. I remember standing there in his kitchen, feeling like a complete outsider in what was supposed to be my future home, with my future husband who suddenly seemed like a stranger. But I was too deep in, too embarrassed to call anything off, and honestly, too scared to start over. So, I caved. Fine. Let's just get this over with, I muttered, feeling a mix of defeat and anger boiling inside. Great, I'll set up a meeting for tomorrow. You'll see, it's all standard stuff. Michael assured me, but his reassurances felt hollow. The next day, his lawyer, a slick guy named Ron, walked me through the document. It's all very straightforward, Ron assured me, flipping through pages that might as well have been written in another language. You keep what's yours, he keeps his. Clean and simple. Clean and simple, right. If only I knew then just how complicated things would get. After the whirlwind of the wedding, which honestly was more of a blur of faces and congratulations than anything, Michael and I settled into what you could call married life. But even that felt more like living with a charming roommate than a husband, what with all the terms we'd signed off on. Michael's life was a series of business calls and trips. Gotta keep the wheels turning, Sarah, he'd say, kissing my forehead before jetting off to some city or another. I mostly stayed back, working from home, trading stocks like it was my lifeline. It wasn't the family life I'd pictured, but then again, what was? His business was booming, and my trading wasn't doing too bad either. But whenever I brought up maybe putting my earnings into buying a place for me, Michael had his own ideas. Hold off on that, babe. I'm eyeing a new property, could use a bit more liquidity, he'd say, always planning the next big purchase. One evening, he came home more stressed than usual. Market's brutal, babe. Got a loan coming up due that I totally spaced on, he admitted over a too late dinner. Can't you roll it over or something? I asked, trying not to sound too concerned. 
that's the kicker. It's tied up with my other assets. Bit of a cash flow snag. He explained, sounding tired. Suddenly he remembered my savings, the ones I'd been hoping to put towards a house, maybe start that dream family. You could help, he said slowly. I mean, it'll ease the snag. Michael looked at me then pleadingly, really looked at me, and for a moment, I thought I saw the man I'd fallen in love with. Okay, I'll do it. What's mine is yours. I said, echoing the words he hadn't exactly said but had implied in so many ways. Right, right, of course, babe. It's just until this thing smooths over. I'll pay you back, he promised, reaching over to squeeze my hand. I nodded, feeling a mix of apprehension and love. Love because I believed in us, in him. Apprehension because, deep down, I knew money and love were a messy mix. Days turned into weeks, and those weeks into months. Michael's promises of repayment became as frequent as his business trips, mentioned but never fulfilled. Our conversations about it were circular, always ending with him kissing my forehead and promising. Soon, babe, soon. And me? I believed him every time. Or at least, I wanted to. Because confronting the truth, that this was becoming less of a marriage and more of a business arrangement, was a reality I wasn't ready to face. The arrival of our son, Jack, was supposed to be the happiest time in our lives, but it quickly turned into one of the most challenging. Michael was often away on business trips, leaving me to juggle the baby, household duties, and my own work. I wasn't just riding the emotional roller coaster of a new mom, I was doing it pretty much on my own. One evening, after a particularly grueling day of balancing Jack on my hip while trading on my laptop, I broached a topic that had been weighing on me. Michael, I was thinking, maybe we could get a little help? Like a nanny? I suggested tentatively over dinner. Michael, who had just returned from a trip to Chicago, looked up from his plate, eyebrows raised. A nanny? Sarah, come on, we agreed you'd handle home stuff. Jack needs his mom, not some stranger. But I'm also trying to work, Michael. The trading doesn't just happen by itself, and it's our livelihood too. I countered feeling the frustration bubble up inside. You're doing fine. What, you want a medal for doing what you're supposed to do? His tone was dismissive, and it stung more than I expected. You knew what you were signing up for. I'm out earning, you're home with the kid. We're both doing our parts, right? As weeks turned into months, the financial strain began to show. Michael stopped transferring money to our joint account, leaving me to handle all the expenses, the taxes on the house, the car payments, groceries, clothes, everything for Jack. It wasn't just the physical toll, the financial juggle was becoming a nightmare. One night, after paying the latest batch of bills and realizing my account was running dangerously low, I confronted Michael. He had just come back from another trip and was in a surly mood. Michael, the joint account is dry. I had to use my savings to cover everything these last few months. When can you transfer some money? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He scoffed, tossing his keys on the table. Oh, come on, Sarah. You live in my house, drive my car, and you're still complaining? You should be grateful. Grateful? Michael, I am managing everything here while you're gone. I'm not asking for thanks, but I need support. I said, my voice rising in frustration. Look, I'm dealing with a lot right now. The business needs every penny. You're not the only one with pressures, Sarah, he retorted before heading off to the shower, effectively ending the conversation. It was clear I was on my own. I couldn't rely on Michael, I needed to ensure financial security for myself and Jack. That's when I threw myself into stock trading more seriously. Each day, after Jack fell asleep, I'd stay up, researching and making trades. Slowly, my account began to grow, bolstered by a series of successful deals. Keeping this a secret from Michael felt wrong, but necessary. He had made it clear that his money was his. Well, mine would be mine. I set up a separate account he didn't know about, moving my trading profits there. It was the only slice of independence I felt I could cling to. Jack was growing up fast, and with him, the daily logistics were becoming more complicated. 
The old car we had was barely hanging on, not nearly spacious enough for his stroller and all the paraphernalia that seemed necessary whenever we stepped out the door. One morning, while Michael was sipping his coffee and scrolling through his phone, I brought up the topic. I need a new car, Michael. The trunk in this one just isn't cutting it for Jack's stuff. He didn't look up from his screen. And you're telling me this why? Planning to make me pay for it? No, I've got it covered. I've been saving up from trading. I replied, trying to keep my voice even. That got his attention. His eyes narrowed as he put down his phone. Oh, you've got money, huh? Well, that's great, because I need some cash. The business could use a boost right now. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Again with the money? What about the money I lent you before? You promised to pay that back, and you haven't. I need a car for Jack, not to sink more into your endless business needs. He shrugged, a smirk forming. Business is what keeps us living in style, Sarah. You should know that by now. Help me out, and I'll get you a new car later. I stood my ground this time. No, Michael. No more. I need to take care of our son. I'm buying the car with or without your help. For a moment, he looked shocked, like he couldn't believe I was defying him. Then his expression hardened. Fine. How about this? If you're so set on this path, maybe we shouldn't be together. You want to split? Because trust me, you won't get a dime in the divorce. Remember that prenup you signed? His words were like a slap. I knew the prenup was there, but his threat to use it so bluntly was still a shock. If that's how you see our marriage, then maybe a divorce is the best thing, I said quietly, the reality of our crumbling relationship hitting me all at once. Fine by me. But remember, you leave with what you came with, nothing. And you'll need to find a new place to live. Consider this your three-day notice," he said coldly, pulling out a drawer and tossing the prenuptial agreement on the table between us. I glanced at the document, the unfairness of it all burning in my chest. You think you can just throw me and jack out like we're nothing? I've been here through everything, supporting you, never asking for anything more than what I put into this family. He laughed, a harsh sound that echoed in the empty room. You think any of that matters? I've got the best lawyers. Don't try to fight me, Sarah. You'll lose. And don't think about taking anything from here. Or I'll sue. Packing was a blur of tears and determination. I collected mine and Jack's belongings, leaving behind everything that Michael could claim as his. I wasn't going to give him any reason to come after me legally. The apartment I found was small, but it was ours, and it was close to Jack's kindergarten, which made life a little easier. Every day, as I walked him to school, I felt a bit more grounded, a bit more like I could do this, raise my son and rebuild our lives. The stock market became my sanctuary and my battlefield. I traded with a ferocity born of necessity, the need to provide for Jack and keep us afloat without any help from Michael. Nights were the hardest, after Jack went to bed and the world quieted down. That's when the doubts and the loneliness crept in. But every time I wanted to give in to despair, I'd look at the numbers climbing in my account, and I'd find the strength to keep pushing. Divorce proceedings were as cold and swift as Michael's farewell. The prenuptial agreement held up, leaving me with nothing but child support, which was a pittance compared to what Michael made. He fought dirty, too, throwing around threats to take Jack if I pushed for any of the money I'd lent him for that so-called urgent loan. It was during one of those mornings, dropping Jack off at kindergarten, that I met Laura. She was the mother of Emily, a little girl with a wild mop of curls and a laugh that could light up a room. Laura and I hit it off immediately, often finding ourselves chatting long after the kids had scampered off to their morning activities. One sunny afternoon, as we watched our kids play, Laura turned to me, her expression curious. You always seem so together, Sarah. How do you do it? I mean, I struggle, and it's just me. I shrugged, my eyes on Jack, who was busy constructing a sandcastle. I guess you just learn to cope, you know? Keep pushing through. We talk about everything and nothing, movies, books, our wild dreams of vacations in exotic places but I never brought up Michael or the divorce. 
That part of my life was locked away, a chapter one was determined to close. One day, as we watched Jack and Emily scramble up the steps of a slide, Laura nudged me gently. You know, if you ever need to talk, about anything, I'm here. Us single moms have to stick together. I smiled, the warmth from her offer spreading through me. Thanks, Laura. That, that means a lot. After a particularly good day on the stock exchange, I felt a rare surge of optimism. Maybe it was the adrenaline from the win, or maybe I just needed a change of scenery from the usual routine. Whatever it was, I called up Laura and suggested dinner at a new restaurant downtown. Sounds like a celebration is in order. What's the occasion? Laura asked as we settled into our seats at the chic, softly lit venue. Just a good day at work, I replied, trying to keep it casual, but inside I was buzzing. It felt like things were finally looking up. As we sipped on our drinks and chatted about mundane things like kindergarten antics and weekend plans, I felt the weight of the past months lighten a bit. But just as I was beginning to relax, a familiar voice chilled the air around us. Well, well, if it isn't Sarah. Looking a bit rough, aren't we? Michael's voice was unmistakable. I looked up to see him standing there, smirking, with a woman clinging to his arm. I felt my face flush, a mix of embarrassment and anger. Michael, I greeted stiffly, wishing the earth would swallow me whole. And this is Vanessa, my fiancé. Isn't she just stunning? Vanessa gave a tight-lipped smile, eyeing me up and down with thinly veiled disdain. Yes, Michael always did have a taste for, well, never mind. Nice to meet you, Sarah. Michael leaned in, lowering his voice, though not his malice. Seriously, Sarah, you look like you've aged a decade. What happened to you? I remained silent, not trusting myself to speak without my voice shaking. Laura, however, was not about to let it slide. Sarah's doing just fine, better even. Looks to me like life's treating her well. Michael snorted, giving me a final smearing look before turning away. Come on, Vanessa, let's leave the past where it belongs. After they left, Laura turned to me, her expression a mix of concern and anger. What was that all about? He's awful. And who talks like that? Taking a deep breath, I filled her in on the brief version of my marriage, the high hopes, the prenup, the threats, the fallout. Everything spilled out in a low, hurried stream. Laura's eyes widened with every detail. Sarah, why didn't you tell me you were dealing with all that? And a prenup? I'm a family lawyer, you know. I want to see that prenup. There could be something there, some way to challenge it. A few days later, I was in Laura's office, handing over the dusty documents that had sealed my fate. She poured over them with a furrowed brow, her pen flying over the pages as she made notes. Sarah, there are several issues here, she finally said, looking up from the papers. First, this was signed too close to the wedding. It's a pressure tactic. Second, you didn't have independent legal advice, which is huge. And third, he didn't disclose all his financial obligations, like that loan you ended up covering. That's misrepresentation. My heart raced as she laid out each point. It means, Laura continued with a smile, that we might just be able to challenge this. We've got a real shot here, Sarah. Sitting in the cold, stark courtroom, my hands were trembling, despite my best efforts to appear calm. The weight of what was at stake pressed heavily upon me, not just the potential financial outcome, but the deeper, more personal vindication against Michael's long-standing control and threats. Before the judge had even called the session to order, Michael leaned towards me from where he stood a few paces away. His voice was low, a venomous whisper, meant only for me. You're a loser, Sarah. You can never beat me. I'll ruin you. And when I'm done, I'll take Jack from you too. Laura, standing by my side, gave my hand a quick, reassuring squeeze, before we were called to present our case. As the proceedings began, Laura was methodical and fierce. She laid out the facts, pointing to the rushed nature of the prenuptial agreement signing and the glaring lack of independent legal counsel. She highlighted the financial disclosures that Michael had conveniently omitted, which directly impacted the terms of the prenup. 
Your Honor, the agreement my client was coerced into signing was not only unfair but fundamentally flawed in its execution," Laura argued passionately. We have clear grounds here to question its validity. Michael's lawyer tried to counter, arguing that everything had been above board, that I was merely having regrets after the fact. But Laura dismantled his points with precise legal references and the undeniable weight of evidence she'd compiled. After what felt like an eternity, the judge finally spoke. After reviewing the evidence and the circumstances under which the prenuptial agreement was signed, I am ruling to annul the agreement due to significant violations in its execution. The courtroom seemed to spin for a moment. Laura turned to me, a triumphant smile spreading across her face. We did it, Sarah, she whispered. Michael's reaction was instantaneous. His face turned a shade of red I'd never seen before as he stood up, his chair clattering behind him. This isn't over. You won't get a dime from me, he shouted, his voice echoing off the high ceilings. The judge warned him to settle down, but Michael's fury was palpable. As we left the courthouse, he followed, his threats spewing out like venom. I turned on my dictaphone and let it record every bitter word, every promise of revenge. You'll regret this, Sarah. I'll make sure of it," he hissed as we walked down the courthouse steps. Later, at the police station, I played the recording. An officer took notes, his expression growing increasingly concerned with each threat uttered. We'll give him a warning. He's not to contact you or approach you. Any further incidents, and we'll take more serious action," he promised. As I left the police station, the legal documents confirming my ownership of two city center apartments and several commercial properties securely in my bag, I felt a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. Over $2 million in assets, it was almost impossible to comprehend. But more than the financial security, it was the freedom from Michael's shadow that felt like my true victory. The passive income from renting out real estate was more than enough to provide for Jack and me and it allowed me to cut back on the frantic trading that had consumed so much of my time. These days, I spend a lot more time with Jack. He's growing up fast, and every moment with him feels precious. We often visit the park, and I watch him play, his laughter mingling with the breeze. One sunny afternoon, as Jack played on the swings, Laura joined us, her daughter Emily in tow. She plopped down on the bench next to me, a smile spreading across her face. You look good, Sarah. Really good. Like a weight's been lifted," she observed, handing me a cup of coffee she'd picked up on her way. Thanks, Laura. It feels that way, too," I replied, taking a grateful sip of the coffee. I'm thinking about buying a house, you know, a real home for Jack and me. Something with a garden, maybe even a place for a dog. As we talked, the conversation shifted to Michael and how dramatically things had changed. Laura kept up with the legal community grapevine, which had plenty to say about my ex-husband's downfall. Word is, Michael's not doing so well. His new fiancée, Vanessa, left him, and a lot of his business partners have pulled back. They don't want to be associated with his reputation after the trial, Laura said, not hiding her disdain. I nodded, not surprised, but relieved I was no longer part of that drama. I heard about Vanessa. Can't say I'm surprised she didn't stick around. Michael's true colors are hard to live with. The idea of Michael's downfall didn't bring me joy, but there was a sense of justice in seeing someone who had done so much harm finally face the consequences of his actions. I was just glad to be out of the storm and into calmer waters. Our conversation drifted to lighter topics, upcoming school events, vacation plans, and community activities. Normal life stuff, the kind I had longed for during all those tumultuous years. Later that day, after Emily and Laura had left, Jack and I walked home, his small hand in mine. Mom, can we really get a dog, he asked, his eyes wide with hope. Yeah, buddy, we can. I smiled down at him. We'll have a big yard for him to play in, and you can help pick him out. Jack's excitement was infectious, and as we talked about what kind of dog we might get, I felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude for the new life we were able to build. It was a far cry from the uncertainty and strife of the past years. I no longer looked over my shoulder, worried about what Michael might do next. 
Instead, I looked forward, to house viewings, to Jack's laughter filling a home that was truly ours, to new memories made in a garden under the sun, and to the simple joy of picking out our new dog.